bags are packed, are you ready to go? This time tomorrow we'll be on the road Riding with you in the sunnier days I wouldn't want it any other <laughs> Welcome to Children of Erte. We're so excited to have you here. Um, <laughs> September is the month of surprises. Um, Adam, we're having trouble seeing, uh, probably because of all those crazy illusions that Silas can do now. I am here, though. I <laughs> am here, <laughs> and I'm going to figure it out. <laughs> um, and uh, unfortunately, Alicia could not join us tonight, so uh, we will miss her. But uh, we came up with something we think kind of cool to uh, uh, do in game with you all tonight. Um, so we might end a little bit shorter than usual, but uh, we're still excited. So Adam, can you still do the sponsors? I absolutely can. I can. I can read off a page even easier now because I don't even have to act like I'm looking at a camera. So here we go. First of all, we have Idol Champions of the Forgotten Realms, which is a D and D strategy video game that brings together. D D characters from novels, adventures, and multiple live action streams into a single grand adventure. You can grab the code on the overlay or in chat to unlock a free Electrum chest. Wow, I do so much better when I read this. Maybe I should read it every week. Uh, we also have Die Hard Dice who has supplied our cast with, here we go, the next one on our list is opposition oracles opposition oracles we had o's tonight um and so opposition oracles for our cast thank you die hard dice you can use the code airte to get 10 percent off your order with die hard dice and there's also going to be a 20 dollars gift card bouncing around in chat so uh, pay attention to that and good luck maybe you will win that and finally, tonight, you'll hear the dulcet tones of Sirenscape because epic games need epic sound. And sometimes epic games need your video to work. So <laughs> we're going to we're gonna try to figure that out as we go here. I am Adam Bradford, the CDO at Demiplane, and I am playing Silas Jordan. Uh, we have no Alicia, so I'm next. Hi, I am Jen Kretschmer. Uh, you can find me on Twitter as at DreamWisp. You can find me streaming on Twitch as DreamWisp Jen. Um, I am a creator. I do a bunch of stuff. Today, we launched an Anansi's Tapestry of Lives, which you can find on Kickstarter. We have funded, but we have all sorts of awesome stretch goals. So please come check it out. We have more than 85 different people who are involved in that project, um, creating NPCs you can drop into your game, professional voice actors doing stuff. I wrote it, uh, an NPC. I'm voicing two characters. We have all sorts of fantastic friends who are part of that. Um, and uh, tonight, I am playing your friendly neighborhood troublemaker, Maeve Morgan Flynn. TM. <laughs> Hi, everyone. I'm Lauren Urban. I'm the content coordinator for Idol Champions of the Forgotten Realms. You can find me on Twitter, Zobo Lauren. You can find me doing a show on Fridays that usually Alicia and, and Jen talk about, but I'll, I'll go ahead and chat a little bit about it because it is tied into Nancy's Tapestry of Lives, which the Kickstarter just happened. And one of the things that we get to do is play a 12-episode show called Radiant Stories, which is telling stories from Journeys to the Radiant Citadel with a whole bunch of people, including people who wrote Journeys to the Radiant Citadel and people who wrote on Anansi's Tapestry of Lives. See, it all is interwoven like a spider web. Uh, speaking of spiders, uh, tonight I'm playing Neb, who hasn't thought about turning into a spider yet, but we're about to go down a cliffside, so maybe she will. <laughs> And hi, I'm Hope Lavelle. You can follow me on Twitter at the Hope Lavelle. And there's Adam. Yay! 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 <laughs> I am uh, really magic. Yeah. <laughs> and tonight I am playing Miss Robin Beckett, your favorite granny. <laughs> and uh, I'm Deborah Ann Wool. I'm your storyteller for this evening. Um, I guess my big announcement: Truest Blood, the podcast that I host with Kristen Bauer, is officially uh, coming back with a season two. Our first episode will. Uh, drop i suppose we say in the industry on monday so very excited it's a lovely companion podcast that goes with the true blood series 
Um, but yes, I am a big D&D nerd, um, proud of it. And uh, tonight, um, we are going to do the 22nd chapter of Children of Airtime. So thank you players and Josh and everyone at home for being here with us this evening. Uh, get cozy and let's set a room. So last we left, uh, you all had taken a, a long rest and had these experiences sort of out in the moonlight um, where each of you has felt quite empowered. Something about the experiences that you've been through, these, these events that you've lived have kind of coursed through your veins and there's something just sort of an electricity within your body that you can feel is a little bit new. You then made your way down the uh, main mine shaft to this very small, narrow crevice in the ground at the beginning of the fourth level tunnels. Uh, this is where you had found the old ancient peat mine that had been you know, stuck into that wall. It seemed very sturdy, so you attached your rope to it. And I believe Silas had offered to be the first to go down. Now we're gonna offer that uh, Alicia's Feruza, the wonderful uh, lumberjack lawyer, um, <laughs> uh, the strength, the heart of this party. Um, we're gonna take a little poetic license and say that she offered to be the uh, last woman standing at the top there, sort of holding the rope, making sure that the rest of you were able to get down safely. So, Silas, as you begin your journey down, it is quite tight. And as I, I if I, you know, I'm sort of guessing Silas uh, correctly, he's a he's a, a broad man. He's husky. He's husky. It's a little bit of a squeeze for you as you as you make your way down. Most um, of the things in this place have been. Yeah. yeah, it's a little bit of a squeeze, you know, but you know, you can make it. Um, but it's definitely a little claustrophobic. There's a, a tightening, especially as you move further down and the headlamps from the rest of your party above begin to dim. Now you are aware that this tunnel, you know, the, the, the floor beneath this uh, crevice is only like, is it like only, is it, you know, like 90 feet down. So this is quite a climb. So as you go down and you're feeling, um, you know, the, the cold stone beneath your hands and, and hearing the sort of uh, clang of your harness as it hits the stone behind you. What's, what's on your mind? Silas uh, almost just disassociates uh, for, for just a little while, but this is not at all unlike Silas because he is daydreaming constantly and the, the key difference now as that's happening is many, and, and no one can probably see this, but as some of these thoughts are, are just kind of striking his mind, he is starting uh, to, to kind of manifest little images of this, um, you know, just, just every once in a while, almost subconsciously, um, you know, and, and again, this isn't like full on reenactment by any means but it but it's uh kind of stylized almost like hand-drawn versions of things um a, as he's starting to think it and um and what's happening is uh silas kind of gets lost in this thought where he is thumbing through a box of old comic books and they're really really old and um you know kind of pans out a little bit you see that silas is sitting in what has to be um, a, a pretty old room because you can tell just from the wood paneling and everything that is is all around here. It is a fairly large room though. And you see uh, what almost looks like a hoarder's um, you know, home, but uh, instead of it being, you know, newspaper uh, clippings and uh, old magazines and those kind of things, there is a treasure trove of stuff that someone like Silas is going to be really interested in. And so he's thumbing through these old comics there. I want to offer that the imagery of this as you're going reminds you in many ways of these tunnels that you've been climbing through in this mine, that the stacks of treasures in this room that you were describing have that sort of windy cavernous feel. 
Excellent. And yeah, everything is piled up really high. There are, uh, you know, not necessarily nice bookshelves, but they're kind of those old wireframe ones that you would see in a garage somewhere. They're, they're kind of placed uh, almost haphazardly all, all through the room. And you see, uh, if you're looking closely at different things, you're seeing all kinds of, um, you know, old so this is like the 12 inch doll versions of uh you know action figures and 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 you're seeing uh you're seeing starting lineup figures from every sport that they made them for you know just kind of kind of laid out and as silas is looking through the comics um he kind of uh moves his hand back a little bit and there is a spider and uh and 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 as he moves his hand uh back he absolutely does not let out um, too much of a squealish squeal, um, but uh, but but then he he decides to get up. He's done with that for now, and he uh, he goes to walk over, and on one of the shelves there are a variety of sports uh, paraphernalia, and many of them are in cases of some sort. So you see a, a bat that um, is signed by somebody, and Silas can't even make out what the name is, and he's trying really hard, but he can't. Um, and then eventually he does land on a kind of acrylic case that has a full size basketball with uh, the signature of Commissioner David Stern on it. And then you also see a uh, an autograph from one Michael Jordan that is is something that Silas can make out because he has studied his signature over and over and over to make sure that he can verify fakes. Um, and so he, he sees this and, um, he, uh, he kind of just, you know, places a hand on it really gingerly and says, um, you know, you're, you're going to be mine. And then eventually, uh, he hears a noise just kind of out of the, uh, you know, side of the room and he turns and he sees a Fox standing like we're kind of almost in a half basement here. So like the window outside has about half of ground. And then out of that, you see, uh, you, you see, you know, actual uh, the top of the ground and, and some longer grass, but the fox is bent down. It's daylight outside. The fox is bent down and it's just looking inside the room. And then Silas just says to himself, oh, hell no. And then he, he runs out of there. The ball actually falls off and the basketball bounces out of the case but Silas is hightailing it out of the, the door to the outside, and he's trying to run around and see if he can find the fox. Now, is and this he, Silas as we know him today, or is this a younger Silas? This Where is Silas about five years ago. So, um, so he, he's definitely, um, you know, still up in his years a little bit, but, um, you know, he, he's kept in reasonable shape. And, um, and as, he sees the, uh, as he sees the fox, kind of enter the woods, he, he takes off running after this fox. And, um, you know, a couple of times he gets really, really tired of it. And uh, he, he's just like, oh, screw this. And, and then he, you know, huffing and, and, and stops running for just a second. And the moment that he does that, he sees the fox again and um, just out of, of his sight. And, and then he, he starts to, you know, uh, enact kind of a, you know, a protocol here where he's like acting like he's not interested in trying to creep closer to the fox what and then the springing at, at this moment. Say again? What is the weather in the woods? It, it's daylight outside, but it is overcast and it's probably about to rain, but it hasn't uh, quite started to rain yet. Great. I, again, I'll offer that within this, um, you can hear thunder in the distance as you are running through the woods. The, the grayness of the um, the sky above and the height of the trees, the darkness of the canopy. Um, there are moments as you're running through the woods that you could swear you saw patches of snow, but that's impossible. Yeah, of course that's impossible. This is definitely not a place where that would happen. And so Silas is going to continue to run after this fox. And eventually he gets pretty deep into the woods at this point. And um, as he's kind of uh, going around, because, you know, that's what Southern, uh, you know, people call forests. We call them woods. 
and so he's uh, he, he's he's you know getting really deep into the woods here. But this is actually a forest. Like this is a pretty sprawling, gigantic place. And so um, so as Silas is going further and further and deeper into it, he crosses a creek at one point and he gets his um, Air Jordans. These were actually the sixes that he was wearing at that time, um, and he gets his sixes. Um, definitely, um, you know, sticks his foot right into the mud really, really bad on it. And then event, and then he looks up and it's almost like the fox is taunting him. And then he's like, and then he just kind of mutters to himself, sometimes you got to roll the hard six. And then he, he, keep, he keeps running and eventually he gets to a clearing and he does not see the fox. And then it's quiet and it's silent for just a little while. And then he comes out of his skin when he hears a voice from his uh, behind him to the right. And it says, what are you doing out here? And this is his pops who is walking around <laughs> in the forest um, and who has apparently been just enjoying a hike. And this is where um, he, he finds him. And the fox at this stage is no longer to be seen anywhere. When you encounter your pops here in the clearing, um, roll an insight check. That is with uh, Silas's gigantic wisdom score. <laughs> um, that is a 15. You can tell that there's a little part of him that isn't surprised to see you. He's acting like it's strange that you would come across him, but there's a little just half smile in the corner of his mouth that betrays that he's sort of new you be. Pops, what, what are you doing out here? It's about to rain. You are like 90 something and you're going to get caught out here and I'm not carrying you back. Seriously. So he's sort of, you know, there's a little twinkle in his eye. Uh, he, you know, hoists whatever sort of bag that he had for his day hike here further on his back and, uh, you know, looks over at you. Probably at one point you both would have been the same height. Um, and I imagine maybe you have some of his physical traits. Maybe you have the same eyes, the same nose. But he, over the years, has lost a few inches. So now you have to look a few inches down. But it is like looking at a version of yourself. He just sort of grins and starts to head off into the wood, um, back in the direction that you came and then as, as this is happening, uh, Silas uh, just starts 90 to nothing. So listen, I saw that you had um, the uh, that old issue of JLA number 19. Um, what, what are you doing with this? You're not protecting these, right? And then he's like, and then I saw that, who, who's bad is that? And he's just like starting to yeah. chatter and ask him a million questions. Pops lets you go for a little while. Um... And after, you know, after listening to him, probably about 20 minutes of this walk back, he's a little slower. He didn't run out here. He finally sort of stops and he looks to you and he looks you right in the eyes and he says, you know, I know that you love all this stuff, but I need to know before I'm gone that you know there's more to life, that you will go places and see things and not just keep them in glass cases. Yeah, Pops, I mean, I, I've done that before and it didn't go very well. It, it didn't go very well. And so everything is a lot safer, a lot cleaner, worth a lot more money <laughs> if it's in those cases. And he sort of reaches out his old wrinkled hand and it has that delicate skin feeling when you, you touch someone and he sort of pats you heavy handed on the back and says, I know. And continues to walk you back to Christ. He says, someday you'll find it in yourself to try. 
And then Silas just launches into another round of questions about <laughs> stuff that he saw before he ran out into the woods. As you are reminiscing about this moment with your pups, um, you find that it's sort of taking your mind off the climb. Uh, you have now found that your feet lose a little purchase. Please make a dexterity saving throw. No, strength saving throw. Strength saving throw. So much worse. Um, that is only a nine. It's only a nine. As your feet lose purchase and you begin to fall, you reach your hands out trying to grab uh, for the wall as best you can. Unfortunately, you fall, unable to grab yourself. The rope, however, tugs you taut, and you are now swinging free about five feet below a hole in the ceiling of this cabin. Those can of I you on the top, you notice the rope going taut. Can I see the ground? Uh, as you turn your headlamp down towards the ground, you can see it's about 20 feet down. Okay. Um, is there a way, uh, can, can, I'm going to start to, you know, thinking about the movies I've seen this in and physics have to work like they do in movies. Um, I'm going to start just kind of adventure w- w- wiggling <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and trying to, uh, get to where I can get back to the wall where I can just try to grab something. I also, at this point in time, will try to use some of my telekinetic force to see if I can stabilize myself and, and get back to the wall where I can continue to climb down. Um, so as you sort of move your headlamp around, you can see that this is this hole is directly in the ceiling, but about 10 feet away is the side wall of this chamber. Oh, so it goes like in more yep. after that hole? Okay, I see. So you are swinging free from this sort of crevice. In the but ceiling. there's no more rope? Like I'm at the end so of the, the rope So the way now? that it was rigged, yeah. there is more rope up there, but they don't, you know, they're stopping you from falling <laughs> the way Got that it. it's rigged up so that you don't fall to the ground. Um, but um, you had a hundred feet of rope, I believe. So yes. you could make it to the bottom of this with that. Okay. So I am going to, uh, I'm going to take just one more glance around to make sure that I don't see any um, albino lampreys um, that are going to attach to me somewhere. Um, and, and once I do this, uh, if, if I feel, I mean, honestly, he's just glancing and he's probably not looking real hard. So there All could right. absolutely still be. Disadvantaged perception check. Yeah. I love that's, it when players give themselves. That, that. That's fair. I mean, like I know who we're talking about here. <laughs> um, that's a six. That's a six. Yep. You, you hear nothing. You see nothing. All I'm going to offer you is it is cold. If the other layers have gotten warmer as you were going down underground, this is now quite freezing. You feel, you know, your everything begins to shiver a little bit. Uh, you can feel the cold air that you breathe in. So at this point, um, Silas is just going to raise his voice, you know, uh, kind of halfway loud. Hello, can anybody hear me up there? Um, so let's have the three of you make perception checks. And if they don't answer, he's just going to yell louder. So, <laughs> so we'll get there. <laughs> oh, I think muted, Maeve. Yes, I am. It's a 21 with a natural 20. Yay. Oh, Maeve. Nice. <laughs> the rest of you can, can roll if you would like. I got um, a 19. So Hope. 17. 17, yeah. All three of you. Uh, Turned absolutely into Silas. Here. Yes. Silas, way down at the bottom. Uh, uh, what did you say again, Silas? Just let down more rope slowly. I'm okay. So well, that, yeah. that doesn't so sound like a, a scream of pain. That sounds like he's still okay. Yeah. That's what I'm hearing. Okay. All right. So yeah, Feruza will come around. She's on the other end of the, the belay. So she can kind of let, you know, pay rope out a little bit. Uh, so that Silas, you sort of slowly, jerkily go down about two feet at a time until finally your toes touch the ground, then your heels. You stand up straight. And as you move your headlamp around, this is a massive, massive cavern. Is there anything in that immediate area mm-hmm. that the 100 feet of rope so i'm imagining i have about 10 feet to play yeah. with or, or whatever 
um, is there anything that I feel like I could secure it against, Definitely. tie it off on? There are stalagmites down there, um, you know, little juts sticking out of the, you know, that wall is only about 10 feet away. There's a place you could, you know, tie things, rocks you could tie, tie to there. Okay, I'm going to try to find a place that I can secure it where it still get, uh, middles up a little bit on that hole. So I don't mm -hmm. want to like tie it, you know, to a wall necessarily sure. where they would so have to do it. Like a stalagmite somewhere at the bottom. Yeah, but, but I am also going to, you know, hold on to it. Um, and mm -hmm. at least um, from the standpoint of like trying to make sure that it's not just going to uh, completely snap the stalagmite um, you know, in half or whatever there. And so mm -hmm. I'm going to kind of hold on to it and then I'm going to shake it just a little bit and say, all right, I think we're about as secure as we can be down here and I'm still alive. So next up, good luck. So to my four up at the top of the crevice, uh, as we said, Veruza has volunteered to be the last to go down. So who would like to go next? I think Neb is itching to go down as quickly as possible. Uh, he got nervous when Silas was going down and there was that moment of tautness, but now that it's safe, yeah, she's she's all game to hook everything up and go. All right. Um, so you step around, hook yourself in. is still going to hold on to the rope again, just in case there's a, you know, a little fall, she can stop you sooner rather than later. Um, and you climb down past this old rusty piton sticking out of the wall and you begin to descend. Now you are much smaller than Silas, so this is fairly roomy for you. Um, you know, you can kind of move side to side and move around certain things, but you are climbing, you know, with your, your fingers and your, your toes and you can, you know, your weight can rest a little bit on that rope, but not very much because they're, you know, want it to, to get you. Um, so as you begin to kind of climb down into this this dark space, I wonder if every once in a, in a while you feel a little heat from that stone in your pocket. Maybe it's just your body heat that sort of warmed it up, but as it gets colder as you descend, you can feel the warmth from that stone. What is it that comes to mind for you? There is part of me that's not surprised because we had almost just lost it. And while um, Neb is always, was very grateful that Silas and Feruza went out and found it, she was never really that worried because in all the years that she's had it, she's always found it. It's always somehow just ended up in the pocket of a different pair of jeans or a bag or something. And Feeling it warm right now, she kind of remembers not just some of those times in where she thought she had lost it and actually panicked and then found it. And then just slowly over the years realized it, she's always going to find it. I don't know. I don't know why. I just always do. It's, you know, maybe, maybe my great grandfather did put a spell on it. I don't know. I don't know. And she's, she's probably thinking about time that he gave it to her and how much it means and thinking about that that memory from oh sheesh must have been 18 19 20 years ago she was real young and it was the last time it was the last time i saw him he had just come back from a, uh, another one of his tours and had gone off to tell stories and had come back and I only got to see him for about a day. He, he was tired from the trip. What was Neb like at that time? How would her grandfather have described her? Tiny. She, she was <laughs> six or seven. She was and she was always a, a small child and a little bit of an indoor child. Not necessarily not, uh, you know, physically active and going out, but she'd much rather stay inside, go see a movie, go read a book, you know, hang out with friends indoors. Um, so yeah, definitely on the small side, but a, a weird bundle of energy that could eventually contain herself 
when she was entranced by something and it usually was when he would when he would tell a story when uh one of her parents would tell a story one of her nibblings would tell a story that that they've kind of learned that if they want her to sit still and not run off and go somewhere or do something or get distracted that a a tale is the best way to do it so <laughs> so i think i think he's he's telling the story while she's in bed like uh, bedtime story kind of thing, but it's his adventures on this most recent trip, meeting up with lots of people and trying to get her to calm down enough to maybe finally go to sleep because it's <laughs> way past her bedtime. What were Neb's favorite kind of stories to hear? I, she appreciated the tales that he would tell about, you know, like myths and legends and uh, those kinds of stories, but she really appreciated the stories of his actual adventures, mm. what he actually did. Even though on a regular basis, he would talk about those things as the boring parts. Like I, I went to this city and got together with a bunch of people in the library and that kind of thing. Uh, but those were, it, it was, because he went on the adventure, because he was there and did the thing, that was even more exciting to her than the the fantastic stories that he would then tell. Uh, so yeah, anytime she could get any details about where he went, who he met, and what he did, and what food he ate, and you know, did you read any books? Oh, you you were in the library. So how big was the library? Was it one of those cool libraries that had like you know twenty billion questions about? his trip even though he would always eventually turn it into let me tell you one of the the fairy tales that i was telling on the trip right um can neb remember the last words her great grandfather said to her uh, so he was telling the story about being on this trip and the trip was he was uh telling stories about astrology about astronomy and the, the constellations and how different cultures have different explanations for the different constellations and that was his way of eventually giving her the, the stone that she has now and she was finally starting to fall asleep by the time that he'd he'd gotten over telling her all of the details about the library and had morphed into telling some of these constellation stories and had been talking about uh, the Greek uh, Titan Asteria and how she was the um, she was in one of the goddesses of the moon and the stars and keeping the night in balance and. Uh, she was actually like the goddess of shooting stars and that uh, how neat it was that he had gone on this trip and then had gotten this gift from some of the people at one of the stops that he was at. And I think what she remembers is him giving it to her and saying, and someday you'll go on your own adventure and have something to give to someone else. You give me an insight check. Okay. Little old Nev doing an insight. Whew. Uh, insightful, 19. So as he says this, and he takes this beautiful polished stone and places it in your tiny hand, I mean, it is larger than the entire surface of your hand. Um, and you think of the number of nights that you slept clutching it in your hand or under your pillow. And you think of him looking at you before you drifted off to sleep. You see his eyes filled with love for you and just the tiniest little twinge of fear a little bit of something, a fear of not seeing you grow up 
to be the incredible woman that he knows you are going to be. I think that's probably an insight she has years later because mm -hmm. he would pass away the next day. So yeah, maybe at, at six and seven, you weren't able to identify it. But as you look back later, you can see. It. Yeah. At this point, you also feel your legs hit free air. Uh, oh, <laughs> the that stops you. It's, it's, it's OK. You're OK. You're OK. Uh, Okay. Silas is below you as he looks up his headlamp, you know, lights up your feet uh, and you can descend the last 20 feet where your feet hit solid ground. Uh, you are surrounded by these, you know, uh, cool old stalagmites. Some of them are only about a foot high. Others are six feet as tall as, as, as Silas and, and Feruza um, towering over you. It's like a strange... Uh, forest of rock uh, here where you are standing. You can hear the constant um, sort of uh, almost sort of hum of silence. Whatever vibrations you and Silas have brought into this room, the whole cavernous space is sort of responding to. And she'll, under her breath, because she doesn't want to I think after yesterday, she has learned that maybe being slightly uh, softer is probably a good idea in situations like this, but she'll say to Silas, wow, stalagmites, right? These are the ones, the ones they on the ground. Are the might reach yeah. the ceiling, yes. They, oh, I'd heard it was- um, tight, holds on tight to the ceiling. Oh, I'd heard mites because they crawl across the ground. And, oh, you know, that works too. Like yeah, honestly, that, whatever works, yeah. Yeah, this is, this is really cool. Yeah. I don't know. Oh, we should we should tell them that like somebody else can come, right? Did did you pull on the rope in a certain way? We just kind of figured it out when you started yanking on the rope, and Neb will just grab the rope and start <laughs> yanking, trying to replicate what Silas was doing. Like, oh, oh, oh goodness, is she? Okay? Do they want us to, to pull them back up? I don't know. Maybe she's in danger. We're, we're okay. We're alive. Silas's voice echoes through the crevice again. I'll Neb's you down do here now. I'll let you do the calling out. You seem to have You have right. a great gift for stating the obvious. <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> well, I appreciate you stating the obvious because this, this is a long way. It's also really cold down here. Nev and I are going to enjoy some lunch, so just join whenever you can. Did you bring lunch? I thought we already had some of those berries. Where are well, they getting I mean, listen, lunch? Listen, the berries, <laughs> Nev, Nev, listen, I didn't want to like get into this too much because what I'm about to say is going to seem incredibly ungrateful, but like man does not live by berries alone. <laughs> but by every rib that comes out of some dead animal somewhere. And like, it's been a long time since I've had some meat. And I, you know, I'm just saying that like, I don't know if I'm gonna be able to make it as great as they are and as much as they fill me up, I'm gonna need to, to do a barbecue at some point. Okay, make me two promises. One, it's not someone I've already talked to. And two, oh, it's yeah, not any of those that. Morlock things, because I don't think any of those are healthy. Yeah, I don't think that those would be good eating, but um, yeah, you know what? Like, you actually know that animals have feelings now, don't you? Like, I mean, I always thought they had feelings. I, maybe I'm, you shouldn't eat meat. Like, maybe people shouldn't eat meat. Well, unlike you, I, I think Neb can live on berries alone now. Yeah, gosh, I don't know. This might be some kind of crisis. Like, I have to weigh the feel potential feelings of an animal versus my need and, and desire to chow down on some some ribs and some some steak and some the porterhouse and all that. Like, I'm going to have to, like, think that through. But we probably don't have cows around here anyway because, <laughs> like, cows come with, like, you know, civilization and we are yet to see civilization so that's true yeah i mean we'd see 
whatever the precursor were to cows, right? Or maybe we will see cows. I mean, we've seen all sorts of other things that are not anything we've seen before. Maybe there's this world's version of a cow. Maybe I'll cut the berries with some granola. <laughs> we got to get back to the train for sure. After well, as, this. as Silas and Neb start to daydream about the the possibilities <laughs> of, of uh, food and, and animal life in this world, uh, we'll head back up with Maeve and Robin. Um, you know, Ruzik is continuing to hold the rope. Which of you would like to come next? Uh, do you mind if I go? Absolutely, dear. Go ahead. All right. I will head down. All right. Uh, you also fit through this uh, space fairly easily and begin to make your, your way down. Um, it is dark. It is cold. Uh, and it is, it's lonely. You know, as soon as you kind of get out of sight and, and you're not catching the light from your friends above or below, um, it feels very isolated what does that bring to you um i think it's a bit uh i don't mind being alone uh it's something i'm used to it's something i grew up with uh i didn't have a lot of consistent people growing up other than my family um so it's not particularly unnerving to be alone. Um, but also, this is a very different sort of place, which is quite exciting, but also a bit terrifying, but also there's a lot of interesting things happening and I'm curious about what's here. But also, I don't want to have to be in charge of any of it. Um, and I think there's um, the corner of a book poking out of my backpack. Mm -hmm. um, ironically, it's a book called A Week in Winter um, by Mae Finchie who's an Irish novelist. Um, and it's a pretty, it's a well-read, well-loved book. Um, and, and folded into the book um, is a letter that has, it's been crumpled up and then sort of unfolded and very gently <laughs> refolded and stuck into the book. Um, and the letter is an acceptance letter and it's on a letterhead stationery and you can see um, that there is Harvard letterhead, Harvard Law School letterhead. Um, at the top of it. Um, and about six months ago, that letter was sitting on a kitchen table, um, crumpled up in a fight. <laughs> um, and uh, Maeve and a tall, sort of sandy brown wavy, messy haired, uh, a little bit gangly uh, boy with green eyes, um, both a little bit drunk, maybe a little more than a little bit drunk, um, <laughs> at the end of an evening uh, out are screaming at each other in a basement apartment in Bed-Stuy. Um, on the wall, there's a picture of Maeve a bit younger um, in North Carolina. Um, and you can see next to her is a woman wearing uh, US Army gear uh, in uniform. And then another woman who is sort of wearing um, clay spattered clothes and an apron. Um, 
and they're all smiling and happy together. Um, and there are various, you know, things strewn about. It is not a well-tended home, <laughs> not a well-kept home. Housekeeping is not high on the list. Um, but there are these books that have been very particularly cared for. Um, and there are these two people standing in the kitchen, screaming at each other. <laughs> Does Maeve remember what they were screaming about? Oh, absolutely. Will had found the letter mm -hmm. and the deadline to register had passed and Maeve didn't care. Did Will leave first or did Maeve? He stormed out. It was, oh, then, then you should just leave sort of situation. Just leave then. Why are you here? Just go. This is about, there's a suitcase and there's a few days worth of clothes that are sort of in a plastic bag for laundry. Mm -hmm. um, you know, three or four days in maybe uh, to his trip. And he sort of rapidly is gathering things up. And What does Maeve regret most? that she said you should just go then. Did he say anything on the way up? He was disappointed in her. Insight check, please. Eighteen. Disappointment is there. But it's the kind of disappointment that someone has, not when you let them down, but when they feel you've let yourself down, when they know that you are capable of so much and they know that you are just scared. And I'm not sure very many people in your life have seen through you that way. Will is the only person who had seen the admittance letters. And it's not just the one, there is a pile of them mm. on that kitchen table. What, what does Maeve wish had happened an hour later, later that night, the next day, the next week, the next month? What she thought then or what she thinks now? Either. Maybe now. Then, We're here now. Then, yeah, you both. Yeah. I guess it's a little bit of the same still, but specifically, specifically then, I regret that I let him see those letters. I should have hidden them. I shouldn't have told him. It, it was the wrong choice to even let him have an inkling that I'd even decided to try and apply, much less had gotten in. And now, I regret that we left it that way and that we hadn't found a way to talk it out since. Do you wish you had called? Do you wish he had called? I think I'm too proud to have called. <laughs> uh, but yes, I, I, I think I, I do wish a bit that I had called. And, and so I figured the ticket was his way apologizing. So. Mm -hmm just taking that and, and sort of um, I 
and wishing it hadn't gotten to me, that it hadn't gotten under my skin. Um, and I'll now, offer, oh. along with that insight, you wishing that it hadn't gotten under your skin, you sense something in him that he wishes more. He wishes that it had upset me more that no just that that you'd let more in oh that's a that's a i think that's a, a fight we've had a couple of times sure and you know uh i think it's been with people that i've dated in the past and with you know the various random jobs i had taken um, I think he was really proud when I when I took the job at, at the law firm that I did, yeah. you know, working at the mailroom because it was like, oh, here's here's it's finally happening. She's going to just get a job and start like climbing the ladder and motivation. It's happening. Yeah. A and and then, no, I just kind of I I was quite content to, to sit there in the mailroom <laughs> and not do anything beyond the bare minimum. Um, so the, there's there's i think he he we we've had that battle a few times mm -hmm. he's the responsible one i'm, I'm not responsible <laughs> i don't want to be in charge i don't want as to you have that, that thought <laughs> about not having to be responsible um but knowing that he even when you're not talking even when you're angry at each other even when you haven't heard from him knowing that he believes in you that he knows you have it in you it's almost worse i'm sure it is <laughs> <laughs> uh, but you feel your feet kick open air um, and looking down beneath you you can see neb and silas at the bottom amongst a sea of stalagmites uh, as they look up at you so you said there was lunch yeah no uh no barbecue unfortunately we've got berries and granola basically a parfait it's a whole yeah. charcuterie just waiting for you <laughs> fair enough right so you just join them and have <laughs> berries and granola okay wonderful i think uh -huh. i think neb has like started to actually pull that stuff out like the, whatever yeah. the whatever berry she has left whatever i think she's got like one granola bar you know and it's is starting to set up and um she might have actually started to, to tell Silas that story that she was mm. thinking about, especially since, like, you were really nice to go get my rock for me. Uh, and so I guess I should tell you why it's so special. Um, but I, you didn't have to worry because, you know, I would have just found it. Is that right? Has it always been that way? Yeah, it, I just always kind of figure out where it is nothing i don't think it's changed around here you know oh. i'm starting to think that like i mean we're all doing magical things around here mave apparently has like a letter opener that expands into some kind of terminator 2 sword or something yeah you'll um, have to tell us what that like you brought a letter opener on a train is that like Feruza's axe and like why'd you bring a letter opener? yeah hey listen like before she gets down here i'm oh. i, I like, I'm not wanting to talk about her, but like, she brought an axe on a train. Like, what? Like, how, how did they even allow her to do that? Like, wasn't there some kind of fine print that you can't bring weapons on the train or something? I mean, there was also no fine print saying that there was going to be a locked room that was going to transport us to a different dimension where we were going to find out that we were magical creatures from another universe or whatever hey, is going on. You Touché, all signed Neb. releases. Touche, Neb. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so like magical things are happening, but I could almost swear, like even when I was climbing down here, I just had like, you know, I was like reminiscing or something and it almost felt like it was like, uh, you know, just just a magical memory or something, but it's almost like I remember magical things happening when we were in our actual world. 
that has to be just completely buck wild, right? Like there's no way like that. That is, it's not like recency bias, but it's like projecting or something because there's no way that magical things actually happen back there. I'm just feeling that way because I can do magical things now. Right. Or the things that you've always been able to do are just different here. Uh, considering last night, because when I was coming down that rope, I also, like, my mind wandered a little bit, and I had a, a pretty, the memory I was telling you about, my, my, <laughs> Dr. Craig. Uh, Maeve, were you suddenly thinking about anything when you were coming down, considering what happened last night in the moonlight and everything? I feel like this place is maybe inspiring stuff? I mean, when it tends to be quiet and still, that's a good time to think. It's like a sensory deprivation tank. But you didn't answer the question. She is evasive. I'm not being evasive. I was just saying that that I tend to think a lot when it's quiet. Well, you don't have to say what, but did did you have a memory that came up like Silas and I did? I did. I wish we could work first. Remember my home. Oh. My partner. I mean, that's kind of what I was remembering, too, in a way. I wish we could warn uh, Robin and Feruza. Oh, no, you're going to remember things about your life. (laughs) Beware. I don't don't know. It felt like a pretty powerful memory to me. So I'm trying not to assume anything. I kind of figure everything that happens here now is happening for a reason and is magical and is awesome. (laughs) Of only, only we could have that outlook. Miss <laughs> Miss Robin, we're all alive. All right. I'm so proud of you. <laughs> that re- that really Robin. hits great, doesn't it, when she <laughs> says that? <laughs> Absolutely. Like, I mean, I know she's not my grandmother, but it's impossible not to feel like, oh, the family member just told me they're proud of me. Like, that's amazing. All right. Yes, uh, Robin, you are next on the way down here. Um, while you are relatively small, I imagine you know the the years have settled a little around the middle. Yeah. Uh, so you too feel a little snug here and there as you you make your way down, uh, climbing. Um, you know, perhaps putting a little more weight on the rope than the others. Uh, but Feruza has you. She locks eyes with you as as you uh begin your descent <laughs> um yeah robin begins to descend and she looks below her and kind of takes in the rock around her and the steps and she kind of calculates and and she turns off her light and she starts to just descend in the darkness just going off a of feeling taking in a quiet moment and uh, she just whispers quietly to herself and she just says, Harold, you should be here with me right now. And she starts to reminisce about him and she begins to think of a memory that she hasn't thought about in a really long time. Oh, when I was 22 years young, I was so full of life and fire. I remember it like the day I was born. I was working at the local flower shop and it was the rush of Valentine's Day. I always liked to work there part-time when things got hasty because Oh, it just made me feel like I was needed. And I loved the rush of making flowers for all of the people in love. (sighs) Something I had not yet experienced at such a young age. But a girl could dream. And so I made flowers for couples and, and 
wives and husbands and friends and potential lovers and it just brought me joy and I would make sure to make every bouquet with love, slipping in my favorite type of flowers here and there, trying to bring as much color to each bouquet. And it was then the ding of the door, the little bell above the door, go off and I looked up and there he was. I could smell him across the room. He smelled like fresh sheets. Oh, he always smelled like fresh sheets. He gave me a smile. He tipped his hat to the woman behind the cash register and he walked straight over to me with a wonderful grin on his face. And he said, excuse me, but I need a very special bouquet for the most special of women. Do you think you can build me something so special? She deserves something incredible. And I smiled sadly at him and, of course I can, of course. What does she like? What, tell me about her. He'd say, oh, she's absolutely the light of every room, a star in the sky. I can already tell she's the love of my life. And so we began to talk about flowers and I asked, I said, well, what is her favorite flower? And he said, I don't know, but I mean, anything you choose will be great. What's your favorite flower? Maybe we'll start there. Well, of course you can't go wrong with tulips. Ah, oh, they're my favorite. And you mix and match them with orchids of every color. And, and so we began to build this beautiful bouquet I put every color of tulip in there, orchids, birds of paradise, and we just made this incredible bouquet. So colorful, so full of love. And I wrapped it with a bow, handed it over. He tipped his hat and said, you don't know how happy you've made me. And I hope this will make her happy too. And with a moment to pay for them, he walked out the door and I went back to making more flowers without a second or third or fourth or fifth thought about him. And it was that night I swept up petals and I wiped down mirrors and closed up the shop all by myself. And by then it was dark. And there was a street light just outside the shop. And as I locked up, I turned and under that street light was Harold holding the bouquet. And he walked up and he said, I got these for you. I hope you like them. And it was from then on, I knew we would spend the rest of our life together. And he whispered to a great adventure. And that was 50 years of quite an adventure. 50 oh, years. Smooth operator. <laughs> <laughs> and I remember the very last thing, 50 years later on his deathbed, I simply said to him, until our next adventure, Harold, until then. And that was it, the end of our story. As you looked at him in those last moments and was he Capable? Did he say anything to you? What were his last words with you? He 
gently held my hand as tight as he could, which wasn't very tight, but he tried. And he said to me, never change, Robin. You'll always be my hummingbird. Give me an insight check. Twenty-one. God, I love that in these moments you are rolling so well. Roll low when I try to kill you. Roll high for the sweet. This is this is the right way to. Do it. I'm okay with this. <laughs> um, it couldn't be anything less than than that. You felt so connected to him in this moment, and as he looked at you and he said those words, never change. And you had always made it a habit to tell people that you were proud of them. And when you look in his eyes in that last one, you saw that he was proud of you. And that he knew you would be. And Robin turns on her light again. As your feet feel the air beneath them, you get a faint whiff of the scent of fresh seat, fresh sheets, but it's very good. Mm -hmm. As you then look down and see your friend standing in the seat. Hey, Miss Robin, you're okay. Oh, thank you, Silas. We saved you some granola if you eat that kind of stuff. Oh, I'd love some. You make your way down uh, to the bottom there. Um, everyone is sitting around again in this forest of stalagmites um, that are just covering, you know, the whole area that you can see right here by the rope. Wow. That was fun. I guess we should let Faruza know. Um, d did anybody see? Did she tie that off on something really secure? Oh, right yes. There? Yes, she did. Okay. We, we made sure it was in the best spot so we could get back up when we need to get out of here. Okay, so let her know? Yes. We're okay. We're not dead. Although if there's anyone who could just climb down <laughs> on her own without a rope. And just, just hand like, over hand just like free Ninja climbing it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, she might be getting used to her new, uh, <laughs> her new size. That's some <laughs> unreal grip strength. <laughs> So yes, we'll have Feruza. We'll start her climb down. You all see the rope moving a little bit as as she makes her climb. Um, we will, when Alicia is back uh, next time we get together, we will find out what her journey is like. Uh, but while you all wait for her, it's going to take her a little time to come down. Um, and she is. She, there's nothing you can do for her <laughs> at the bottom here. Um, is there anything you would like to do uh, before we close? Up? I, I do want to call out that. So as everyone has been coming down, uh, Silas is still um, can't get him to stop talking. Um, so he, he talks to to whoever, but he is, um, you know, he's looking up pretty continually because he is. Um, he is convinced that if somebody slipped and fell, that he could telekinetically catch them. And yes. so he is, uh, he, he's kind of watching just to be sure. And if anybody's paying really close attention, they might uh, tell that, but otherwise he's, he's not acting like he's paying attention. Cool. I'd like to talk to Neb a bit about her stone. Yeah, sure. And you can see Neb, I think Neb notices that Silas is doing that. And so mm. she now takes license to like, She's keeping an eye out for danger, but also she's checking out this cavern. Okay. And so maybe when you when you chat with her, she's like, uh, yeah. Uh, it's quite a quite a piece there, Hugo. Oh yeah. Um, so it's a it's a piece of a meteorite that fell a bunch oh. of years ago that that that's what they gave my grandfather or my great grandfather when he went on this tour and he gave it to me. So it's got this like, and she pulls it out and shows it to you. And you can see once again, it's, it's mostly just this black, almost obsidian rock, but the light from your headlamp and whatever other ambient light is around shines off of it kind of sparkly, like rainbow sparkles. And she's like, 
I was told the science behind what happened when some meteorites fall to earth and they, they do this, but I've completely forgotten because <laughs> that was a little more science than I think I could remember. But I mean, it's very pretty. I think that's why I liked it when I was young and now I just always have it. As you're looking at the rock in your hand now <clears throat> and your headlight bounces off of it and bounces off the stalagmites around you, um, they're not made of the same thing, but the mica inside of those stalagmites and the frozen, you know, the, the ice, essentially, the frost that is covering each of these glistens with the same kind of starlight sparkle that you see within there. I mean, looking around here, maybe all these are made out of meteorite. I, uh, Dr. Craig told me that it was a special thing, but here we are in a special world, so <laughs> who knows? Did you want to see? And uh, she'll sure. hold it out to you. And it's it's, it's, it's amazing size. that you've kept it all these years. I it's can't. See, oh, thank you. I, I can't seem to lose it. It just, I always seem to find it. Oh. I go looking for it and then I don't find it. And then it just, you know how sometimes you put something in your in your pocket and then you forget it's there and then you think you put it in another pocket, but then eventually mm -hmm. you find it in the wash. It's, it's, it's kind of like that. It just always kind of shows up wherever, you know, maybe the longest I didn't have it was an overnight. That happened with me with Skittles one time. Like the candy? Actually, that happened twice and possibly three times. Like, um, <laughs> but, but yeah, like Skittles. Like, I left them in my pocket, couldn't find them. And then I found them in the wash later. <laughs> oh. They did not oh. taste the same. And you ended up with same. a tie-dye shirt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. They would uh, make a, a really good shirt, probably, if I had intentionally done it. You can also separate, separate them out and put them into vodka and you get colorful rainbow vodka. Taste the <laughs> rainbow. Ooh. It's a party. That, uh, that does sound kind of pretty. Maeve would know that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Maeve would. You just filter it through a coffee filter, get out the, 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 the material in it, and you end up with the colorful flavored vodka. Just a fun party <laughs> drink. Uh, you know, I'd heard about that with gummy bears, but never with Skittles. How, where do you learn those kind of things? Planning parties, <laughs> um, going to parties, partying. You and I went to Take different it. parties, but they sound like fun. Sometimes. <laughs> the next morning can be a bit rough. Uh, oh, yeah, I guess if you're drinking sugar. the wrong colored yeah. vodka. Yeah. yeah, sometimes we would get together and play, you know, Descent or something, and we would drink Mountain Dew all night long and flaming hots and you know all those things and, and it would it would feel really rough in the morning mm. yeah it would, it would feel really rough in the morning so yeah i understand sometimes yeah. you just hit it too hard robin as the others are talking about liquor and candy uh <laughs> what are you are you checking anything out are you you know listening to the conversation what's your, your moment robin is just listening to these guys back and forth and just kind of taking in the moment to be almost overly grateful for them you know just everything about them right now just makes her smile just mm. like a family and that smile makes neb look over and say all right uh miss robin what's the the best alcoholic party <laughs> drink that you've ever had <laughs> I'm, I'm sure you've probably invented a cocktail <laughs> you gotta keep it simple. You just take some ginger ale, some red hots, those cinnamon imperials, you put them in, you mix it around, and just a hint of rum. Mm, mm. Perfect. When we get back what do to we the call train, that, Robin? <laughs> when we get back to the train, we're gonna have to try all these. I call it the throwback. <laughs> <laughs> And coming soon, the children of Erte cocktail. Yeah. 
Oh, yeah. cocktails. Those of you of, of drinking age, <laughs> you throw back a try and let us know how to do it. <laughs> Sounds kind of interesting. Uh, Maeve, as you hand back her her rock and she puts it back into her pocket, she'll look at you and say, can we see your letter opener or is it going to do something weird? And yeah, like, don't point it at us. <laughs> I mean, I trust you. If you it's point a, it at me, it'll be fine. It is a letter opener. <laughs> it's not a. It's not a. A joke buzzer or anything like that. So it's not a letter opener when you're slicing things open with it. Well, that's I the mean, point of a letter opener is to slice things open. Typically, envelopes typically or letters. envelopes, depending on how you pronounce it. But um, but yeah, uh, not like throats and flesh. And you know, wolf, wolf hide. Oh, you don't typically have cause for that, but needs must, I suppose. So, why did you bring a letter opener on the train? I it's mean, is it just like my those, rock and Feruza's like axe? Lucky charm. It's a. Oh, I hate saying those words. In my accent is just, <laughs> never goes well. I wasn't. Please I wasn't gonna do this commercial thing. I really want thing some cereal don't worry. now. No, don't like, worry. Of course not you after your lucky charm. Don't know. <laughs> no, no one's gonna. I mean, you are magical. I'll say that. Magically delicious. I wasn't gonna say that, Silas. We already had the discussion about how I'm just basically a berry person now. <laughs> but but yeah, it's it's. Booberry. That's where it's at. It's kind of your, your I'm rock or your in a person myself. But. Yeah, that makes sense. I mean, I typically am, but I mean, sometimes on special occasions, you bring out the boo. I'm gonna be honest. I had all of those cereals like I, they were dessert because you know you'd put the 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 chocolate ones in the milk and then it basically make chocolate milk, and so yeah, I don't you think you drink that stuff at the end. Yeah. Yeah, I don't <laughs> or know. You just if... eat them dry, like like popcorn. I haven't tried that before. You're a monster. Movie, right? it's <laughs> cereal. Uh, no, it, it's just, it's one of those things that just, I like to have it with me. I, I can't explain it. It's just a. Part, it's been something I carry with me for so long that it's just sort of can't imagine not having it. Listen, you don't have to explain that to me. And she pats the pocket with her rock and then we'll look over at Silas and look up at his hat <laughs> and just take a long look at his hat. Robin why are you, why are you looking at me like that? Yeah, Robin. And her little toes sticking yeah. out through your feet. As you all notice these lucky charms uh, that you all have with you, um, you see Feruza's feet appear up in that, uh, you know, the, the uh, crevice up above. Um, and as you look at each of you, you can see your breath in the light of your headlamps. And, and again, you're all really, you know, you're starting to feel it is coming in through your clothes, your coats, that real deep chill. Um, as Feruza makes her way down to the bottom of this rope, uh, those of you knowing now that she is safe could start to look around. You can see that really this area around you, this forest of stalagmites, leads a little bit of a ways away from this wall and then ends just a huge clearing in this cavern to the side. And just at the end of your light, you believe you see a wooden heading out over a frozen lake. And with that, we will conclude this chapter of Children of Airplay. Thank you all so much for being here with me today. I'm sorry it's a little bit short this week, uh, but we will hear the fantastic adventure of Beruza climbing down the crevice, as well as continue uh, with our adventure next time on Children of Airte. And until then, please remember that life itself is the most wonderful. Good night.